Okay. Let's all quieten, quieten our hearts. And welcome back. It's good to have you all back. It's been very refreshing. It's good for us to be together and hear the word of the Lord. So let's just begin with prayer, not just, but let's begin with prayer. It's not a just. And then we'll have a time of worship and then we'll give the time to Brother John for the afternoon session. So let's pray. Let's bow our hearts and our heads before the Lord. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we'll once again have. We once again lift our cups towards heaven. We expect a blessing because we know what comes from you is good. It's what we need. Thank you that you are a good God. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that we can know you. Thank you that you've translated us into the kingdom of your dear son. Thank you you've given us the privilege to be a part of what you are doing. And Father, we come this afternoon. We want to sit at your feet. We want to learn of you. We pray that you would grant our hearts and our minds the understanding we need. We ask for wisdom. We ask that you might show us your will. So we pray that you would speak to us. We pray for your word to be tailored to meet the needs of our hearts. You know where we are at. You know what we need to hear. So we pray that you would be able to minister. We pray that the word of God would have free course. We pray that you would grant us soft hearts that you can mold and you can shape more and more into the image of your dear son. Cleanse us from all sin, unrighteousness. Purify our thoughts and our motives. We lift up our brother John that you would strengthen him Give him grace, inspire his heart, give him a clear mind, help him to proclaim your word, grant our ears hearing. So we want to commit this next couple of hours to you. We pray that you would take the throne of this meeting and you would have the preeminence in all things. We invite you, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name, amen. Brother Victor, and then after after worship, Brother John, the time is yours. Good afternoon. Let's take our songbooks and turn to six hundred seventy nine. 679. Christ, the life of all the living. <clears throat> 679.
Numbers on the Lord's side. Ah. Uh -huh. 
Okay, are you people ready to sing the song? I am. <laughs> You're ready? Okay. Come on over here, some seeds. Why don't you come around over here? I know the Lord will make a way for me if I live. Shun the wrong and do the right. I know the Lord will make a way for me. I see we already have a song leader here. <laughs> okay. I want the Lord to have his way with me. I want the Lord to have his way with me. Though the need be great or small, I would give to him my all. I want the Lord to make his way with me. How many can tell me what happened in the last lesson? The print shop burned down. And what do you think William Carey said? This is what he said. He said, how marvelous are God's ways. I had just made my translations as perfect as I could make them. And maybe I was a little bit proud of the mission. I think God had this happen so I could trust him more. And I will be still and know that he is God. Well, William Ward started digging around in the uh, ashes. He was so glad that the five print presses, printing presses had been taken out of the building before they burned. Uh, but the type had been lost. It was lead and the fire just melted into the big blobs. But as he dug around in the ashes, he found the forms for those types, the steel forms for those lead types. And all 14 languages uh, had forms that had been preserved. It had taken them 10 years to make this. That would have been 10, 10 years of work lost. So he was so glad they had the forms to uh, remake the type and uh, get started printing again. In a month, they were printing again. They had soon had five presses going. They had uh, 10 people helping them. And uh, they were soon printing uh, the Bible again in more languages than before. And William was very, very busy. But something had happened 11 years before that had made him even busier. The government of England had started a college in Sarampare that I had up here on the board to train judges and officers and governors for the British government in India. And they said to themselves, well, who could we get to uh, teach the languages of India? And right away they said, well, there's nobody that knows the languages of India better than William Carey. So we will invite him to come and teach in our college our government college. And so they came to William Carey and asked him, would you teach in the college for us? And William considered it, he prayed about it, he discussed it with William Ward, and uh, they decided that yeah, he could go teach in the government college. So every Wednesday evening, every Tuesday evening, he went down the river to, to uh, Calcutta, and uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, he taught in the government school. He taught the languages of India. He also, in the evening, started a church in the city, and he preached there every evening. He talked to students. He was able to win many people to the Lord during the 30 years that he taught in that government school. But while he was teaching in that government school, he had a dream. He dreamed that someday there would be a Christian school, a Christian college, where they could train pastors. He said, we will never be able to preach the gospel to all the people in India. We need to train pastors to go throughout India. We need to build this uh, Christian college. Now, he had been paid a lot of money to teach in the government college, and so he and William Ward started to save money. They saved money for seven years, and finally, they, uh, here, here he's going down the river. I'm sorry I did not show you this. Uh, he, finally, they saved enough money to build the first building for Sarampare College, where they could train pastors and teachers. And William was busier than ever. His lamp in his bedroom burned late into the night. People thought, what kind of person is William Carey? Does he ever sleep? He never seems to get sick. He always has lots of energy. He works harder than anybody. But finally, one day, he laid down his pen. He had corrected the last translation. And he said, my work is finished. And then he would sit in his garden. And people would come from around the world to talk to this man. 
He had a beautiful garden because he, you remember, he liked plants. He had gathered plants from all over India, trees. There was a big pond in the middle of the garden. It was just a beautiful place that he liked to walk and talk with God. And so he would sit in his garden and people would come and talk to him. And he would talk to them about what had happened all those years that he was in India. He was there for 40-some years, 41 years, I think. Remember, it had taken five and a half years to do the first translation. Now the Bible had been printed in 34 languages. Remember, it had taken one, it had taken seven years to win the first person to Jesus. And now there were 26 churches preaching the gospel and 50 pastors preaching the gospel to thousands of people. But one of the things he was so happy about, remember how the they used to burn the women whose husbands died. He had just talked to the government year after year and said, we must have a law against this. And finally, there was a law against that awful, awful practice. And so he was so happy. He said, I don't have one wish that has not been fulfilled. So shortly before he died, a friend of his, uh, Mr. Duff, visited him. And they talked over all the things that God had done in India. And when he went to leave, when Alexander Duff went to leave, William Carey called weekly out, went, I'm gone. Don't say much about William Carey. Talk about William Carey's Jesus. And so here's a man who went to India, very poor, and yet he made many people rich. He didn't have a lot of education, but he taught in a college and established a college. Remember his motto, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God, and here he had done so many things for India and had been such a blessing. But remember, as a little boy, he was a very determined person. Whatever he started, he finished. And that's why he was so successful in India, because when God gave him a task, God knew he was giving it to somebody who would not quit until it was finished. So that's how you can get prepared for what God wants you to do. Learn to be a person that when you have something to do, do it with all your heart and don't quit until it's finished. You may, you may be dismissed. Now I'd like for you to turn in your hymnals to <clears throat> number 153. a very familiar song. I'd like to tell you how it came into existence. <clears throat> You'll notice on the left-hand side at the top and on the right-hand side, the uh, tune and the words and the, the, the uh, refrain for this song was written by Frederick M. Lehman. One evening after a, uh, a, a church service, the pastor closed the service by quoting these last words, the words of the last stanza. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies a parchment made, were every stock on earth a quill, were every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. That's magnificent poetry. And Frederick Lehman heard that and he was sort of curious where did that come from? So he did some research and discovered that it was taken off of the wall of an insane asylum. There had been a Jewish person who had been incarcerated there and at some lucid moment had penned these words from a wonderful poem written in the 1100s. And so <clears throat> uh, he did some more research and uh, discovered this poem. It was a poem about God's love for Israel. This, this, uh, this was written uh, 1,500 years ago, almost. Uh, 20, 1,200 years ago. And in that poem, it had many incidents where God had spared his people, had shown love to them. One of them was a case where a priest had accused some Jewish rabbi of some terrible sin. And the governor of the city said, he will destroy all the Jews in this city unless somebody can make a defense against this accusation. And so a Jewish rabbi stepped up, he made the defense, and the city was spared. And so uh, Frederick thought this song certainly should be a hymn. So one day he sat down while he was at work between jobs and he wrote the first two stanzas. He wrote the 
refrain, and he wrote the music. And I'm so glad he did, because otherwise we would not have this wonderful song. But it was based on that last verse, could we would think the ocean fill would be impossible to write the love of God completely. Okay, let's sing this song, The Love of God. No, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. When hoary time shall pass away, and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong. Redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels' song. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies a parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry? Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and day. Song. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 24. The message is a call to arms. Thomas Jefferson said, The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Peter said, Be sober, be vigilant. That means be in very, very, very careful watch. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfastly in the faith. And Paul is basically saying the same thing in different words. And as a 77-year-old man looking over my life and what has happened, this is a very relevant warning. I grew up at Chambersburg Mennonite Church. It was a mainstream Mennonite church. It was a large congregation. I had 20 peers, boys my age, one or two years on either side. All but one, to my knowledge, has either assimilated into the world or has gone completely to the world, except for one. We had revival meetings one year by a man who every night told the people who had responded the night before, and he listed them, about 20 years later, my mother wanted those reel-to-reel -reel tapes put on cassettes. I was a typesetter, and so I could listen while I was uh, tra uh, tra putting those onto cassette tapes. And it was interesting, 30 years later, I'm sorry, it was 30 years later, to listen to those names and, in my mind, think about what had happened to them. And here they were, 
30 years later, I was hearing these names read off of people who had responded each night. I wasn't able to track all of them, but the ones I could think of, every one of them had been lost to the church. A really shocking example is Howard Hammer, who was the first Mennonite mass evangelist that George R. Brunk and Myron Augsburger imitated. He was the first evangelist in the Mennonite church to put up a tent and preach to crowds of people, inviting people to respond to Christ. What happened at the end of his life is he got involved with a Spanish woman, and at the end, he shot her and himself. And that shocked the Mennonite world. Marin Augsburger, who had been one of his converts, was absolutely shocked. It took him quite a while to recover from that horrible experience. Corporate apostasy. The early church held to non-resistance. And you need to tell your people that you talk to about this subject. Uh, finally, you, let's go to history. For almost 200 years, the church held to the position that it was wrong for Christians to be involved in any violence, and certainly in war. And then in AD 174, we have the first record of a soldier joining the Christian church. Tertullian opposed this compromise with great vigor, but it was the thin edge of the wedge that finally brought that problem into the church. And in A.D. 313, uh, about 125 years later, Constantine baptized his entire army into the church. And a few years later, the church and the state were united. An example of the horrible uh, inconsistency now that was in the church, John Bowring that wrote, wrote that wonderful song, In the Cross of Christ I Glory, the story is he was sitting on the deck of his ship looking at a church that had been bombed and all that was left was a wall with the cross and he was singing in the cross of Christ thy glory but what they don't tell you when you hear that story is below the deck of his ship were hundreds of slaves. He was a slaver and called himself a Christian. I'm just giving you examples from history how quickly this turns into something very different from Christianity. The Waldensians in 1176 began with the conversion of Peter Waldo and they were faithful into the 1500s. But after 350 years of tremendous suffering and faithfulness, they joined the Reformation, they joined Calvin's people, and became Reformed Christians. After three centuries of refusal to compromise through tremendous suffering and persecution and faithfulness, the majority of these people ignored the protest of a faithful minority and were absorbed into the Reformed Church. The Christian life is not a sprint. It is a marathon. It is not a brief skirmish with the devil, but it is constant hand-to-hand -hand warfare. Ephesians 6, 10 to 24, let us read. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that I might therefore speak boldly as I ought to speak. In Ephesians, the whole way through this book, Paul is assuring us that God gives us a great wealth of resources. Remember that picture I showed you on the board. All of heaven's resources made available to us. He tells us in this book that God adopts us into his family. We actually receive God's nature. His, the thing that drives God himself we receive. 
He redeems us by his blood. He forgives us our sins. He abounds toward us in wisdom. He abounds toward us in prudence. We've discussed all of that out of the first chapter. He seals us with the Holy Spirit. He gives us a supernatural drive to uh, live the life that he wants us to live. All of the resources of heaven are placed at our disposal, and the church is filled with all the fullness of God. We have tremendous resources. St. Patrick said it this way, I arise today through the strength of heaven, and here are all the resources, light of the sun, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of wind, depths of the sea, stability of the earth, firmness of the rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak to me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me from afar and near, alone or in a multitude. God shield me today against wounding, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the eye that sees me, Christ in the ear that hears me, hears me. I arise today through the might and strength of the Lord of creation. <laughs> That's why he went forth each day and of course did a mighty work for Ireland. With all the saints, we are able to comprehend, that is, with all the saints. We're not talking about individualism here. I've been, I've been preaching against that the whole weekend. With all saints, we can comprehend the breadth, the length, the depth, the height of God's love, and all relationships can be brought into reconciliation through Christ. Now, that was a suitable place for Paul to end his epistle, but as he was writing his epistle, he was chained to a Roman soldier. And he was reminded that life is a battleground, not a playground. He was reminded that the Christian needs to be armed as a soldier. That there would be a great cosmic clash between two violently opposed kingdoms. And finally, his important last words were, there would be warfare on a grand scale. Only those who fight with courageous and vigilant persistence will win. Paul himself was dogged with conflict. Hear what he says. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths off. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings off, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings off, in hunger, thirst, and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides these things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches, and then of course within his own, his own self. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So Paul was picturing tremendous conflict from without, tremendous conflict within, and he was fighting that battle to win. Now, the key here is to be strong in the Lord. Obey the commander explicitly. The commander is always wiser. He has the total perspective. And it's, we win as we listen explicitly to what he has to tell us. So, <clears throat> there are three uh, <clears throat> enemies. The world, what is the world? The world is systematized evil. It's a whole universe of interrelated evils and lifestyles. It's a, it's a total picture of the world with all of its many things in one package working together. What is the flesh? The flesh is inordinate desires to satisfy self. I think I talked about beds here, didn't I? About how that uh, goes off into indulgence and that's how the desires of our flesh go. And then the devil who is a liar who uses both the world and the flesh to destroy us. Well, there are three things we need to understand and I'll try to cover them rapidly here today. The warrior's enemy, in chapter, verses 11 and 12. The warrior's equipment, in 13 to 17. And the warrior's energy, in 18 to 20. The warrior's enemy. In a battle, there always are an intelligent core, intelligence core, 
that constantly is accumulating as much knowledge as possible about the enemy, usually in some code that nobody can decipher. Well, God has given us all the things we need to know about the devil. Number one, he is a formidable foe. The Bible says he's an accuser of the brethren that accuses them before God day and night, and we know what he did to Job. Okay? The adversary uses lies. He says God is not good. That's basically what he said to Eve. He said God is withholding good from you. He knows very well that if you eat of that tree, you will be wise, you will enhance your life immensely. And he's trying to keep that from you. God is not good. He takes the form of a lion. He takes the form of a serpent. He takes the form of an angel of light. He takes the form of a god of this world. And he has helpers, demon helpers, against despotis despotisms, against powers, against master spirits, who are the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spirit forces of wickedness in, heavenly, in the heavenly sphere. That's from the Amplified Bible. So he is a formidable foe. Number two, he controls the affairs of nations. Back in Daniel, we have the prince of Persia, the demon force behind that prince, who was even able to keep the angels from coming to Daniel for three weeks. He's not only strong, but he's subtle. Remember the Gibeonites who came to Joshua and said, we're from far away, we came here, uh, you know, we need some help, and uh, we want to make a league with you, but we're from far, look at our, look at our worn out clothes, look at our stale bread, and here they were neighbors, and uh, they were deceived. He pits faith against works, we talked about that. He pits justification against sanctification. He, I'm sorry, he doesn't pit them against each other. He tries to separate them. He causes us to borrow from other methods and lingo that's foreign to the gospel. He confuses us with excitement, which we can believe is the work of the Holy Spirit, which is not a work of the Holy Spirit. It's just excitement. I'm talking now, Prince, is about music. Uh, psych it up, psych it up, and everybody thinks, oh, this is the spirit moving. And it's not really the spirit moving. We'll talk about that tomorrow evening. He gets us to teach principles without practical expression. We just talked about that. He gets us to condone self-expression and individualism as an evidence of vital spirituality. He has us champion variety instead of oneness. He says that worldly fashion is only a matter of taste. It's not really worldliness. And we can go on and on. We are not ignorant of his devices. He masquerades as an angel of light and usually in the form of Christianity. Most of the deception that take Christians are false versions of Christianity, backed up with convincing arguments. And that's why I have a deep suspicion of systematic theology. Much of it is simply a rationalization for things that the gospel has clearly told us and we want to disobey. He blinds men to the truth. They cannot see afar off. That's the biblical definition of blindness. They cannot see afar off. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. So blindness for the Christian is not that he can't see at all. It's that he can't see afar off. He sees only the immediate present. That's blindness. And so he says we need to use all our armor and stand our ground. So here's the warrior's equipment. That was the warrior's, <coughs> uh, yeah, the warrior's enemy. So what equipment do we need? Well, he talks about the girdle of truth. Truth is integrity. Integrity means to integrate. It holds everything together. Falsehood fragments. Dishonesty disintegrates. We should eagerly and tenaciously grasp every truth from God and experience. Honest thinking versus the rationalization we talked about. Okay? Romans 1.18 says that people suppress the truth by ungodliness. And usually when I read that, I thought, well, that's what non-Christians do. But Christians can do it too. If they want to do something that's wrong, they suppress the truth. They close their ears. They rationalize. In some way, they suppress the truth they don't want to hear. And we need to protect against that. We need to put on the girdle of truth. That love, we love truth. We don't suppress it. We eagerly and tenaciously grasp any truth that we know is coming from God. The second piece of armor is a blessed breastplate of righteousness. Right living protects the heart. 
I think we talked about that last evening, that everything we do, everything we say, registers as a desire. And if we live right and speak right and do what's right, that rep that, that's a defense. That represents, that, that, I'm sorry, that protects us from deception. It keeps our heart. It gives us the right kind of desires. And our heart is here. This is the breastplate, right living. E. Stanley Jones made this comment years ago, and I put it on the wall of the school where I was teaching, and I generated a tremendous debate, and you folks can debate it too. He said this, it's easier to act your way into right living, I'm sorry, it's easier to act your way into right thinking than to think your way into right acting. <laughs> See, everybody wants to do it theologically, and he says, the best way to get your thinking straightened out is to begin doing what's right. He says, it's easier to act your way into right thinking than to think your way into right acting. You can go and discuss what you think of that quote. But I think that's what this is saying. It says righteousness will be a protection for the heart and, in, and your desires. The gospel of peace. You can't stand if your feet are wounded. And he says the, the, the protection for our feet is the gospel of peace. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Peace with God gives us clear direction to walk without wounding our feet. If you turn to 1 John chapter 2, it tells us how important it is to have peace with our brother. A very important truth here that convicts me every time I read it. Listen. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. That tells me that all sin is somehow based on a wrong relationship with somebody somewhere. And stop and think about it. If you lie to somebody, there's a problem with the relationship here. If you steal from somebody, there's a problem with the relationship. If you fornicate with somebody, there's a problem with the relationship. The relationship's not, there's not real love there. And obviously, if you hurt somebody or kill somebody, there's a problem uh, with the relationship. I mean, if you don't love somebody and you kill somebody, there's a problem with the relationship. Peace is a tremendous protection for the way we walk. If we have peace with people, we will have a tremendous ability to walk without stumbling. Politics is usually motivated by hatred against the other side. And that's how it functions. But it's not as strong as the truth. Near the end of his life, Napoleon came to the following conclusion about the King of Kings. He said this, Alexander, Caesar, Caesar Charlemagne, and I founded empires, but on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ alone founded his empire upon love, and at this hour, millions of people would die for him. Okay? The shield of faith, what are we talking about? Well, I like this little acronym for faith. This is how I think faith, this is what I believe faith is. For all, I trust him. Trust means you do what the person says, okay? We trust what God says and obey explicitly. And he says that's a shield that protects us. We learn to see and avoid clever rationalization, as I talked about earlier. We do not think it's salvation by theology. We think it's salvation by obedience. All right? <laughs> theology is an interesting thing. The Roman Catholics often talk to me on the phone, and one of the questions they ask is what I believe about transubstantiation. And I say, you mean to tell me that I have to have a theology about communion? Why can't I just take it and let happen whatever happens? If it turns into the blood and body of Christ, which of course I don't believe it does, but if it does, so what? If it doesn't, so what? We were asked to practice it, not understand it. Okay? What did Jesus actually say? This is our concern. What did he actually say about wealth? 
What did he actually say about spiritual security? What did he actually say was the evidence of the Holy Spirit? My charismatic friends say that speaking in tongues is the, is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. But my Bible says, be filled with the Spirit, there it is, speaking to yourselves in tongues? Oh, well there's where the Holy Spirit should have put it. If that's the evidence of being filled with the Spirit, it should be right there. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourself in tongues. <laughs> It's pretty clear, I think. So what's the evidence of the Holy Spirit? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's the irrepressible song. It doesn't matter what people do to you, you're still singing. They can burn you at the stake and you'll still be singing. That's supernatural, my folks, to be able to sing in life's worst circumstances. And this says that's one of the evidences of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Christians, true Christians interpret the epistles through the Gospels. They don't go to the epistles and construct a theology and then try to impose that on the Gospels. They think the Gospels and the epistles are both equally important, but they say the Gospels are primary. That's Jesus' teachings. The epistles came out of that. So nothing here is permitted to contradict anything here. How many understand what I just said? That's the difference between Anabaptism and Evangelicalism. They're forever constructing their very systematic theologies from the epistles. And then it's N.T. Wright who said, then they take their theology and they bring it over to the epistles and it doesn't fit. And so you can be a member of their churches and you can be divorced and remarried. You can swear oaths. You can go to war and kill people. You can accumulate wealth. You can, in short, disobey everything Jesus said because you're being saved by a theology rather than being saved by the response of obedience to Jesus and faith in him. So we need to have the shield of faith, which is nothing more than explicit obedience to Jesus. And then he says, take the helmet of salvation which protects our head. The mind is the key. And that's why the Bible says we should get all the knowledge we possibly can. Epignosis, I think I gave that the other evening. Super knowledge. We should have a very clear mental understanding of the gospel because we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. I had that diagram here. It's the renewing of the mind, not feelings influencing the mind and rationalizing, but the mind influencing the feelings and the will and being lived out than through the body. We should reckon ourselves dead unto sin. We should go into every temptation knowing nothing can make us sin if we have on our armor. If you act in obedience, as I told you the other evening, I'm summarizing a lot of things in this message, you have all of heaven behind you. The Word of God is quick and sharp and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So fill the memory with God's supernatural words. That has been a tremendous help to me. As a young person, I memorized whole passages in the Sermon on the Mount and whole books of the Bible. Fill the memory with God's supernatural words, and they will be there to use as a sword against evil. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. The Waldensians did that. You have to remember the Waldensians were before the printing press for several hundred years at least. And uh, they are known to have been tremendous in their memory of scripture. In fact, I read one account where somebody met a Waldensians at a crossroad and they say he stood there and quoted to them the whole book of Job. Can you imagine? That's the warrior's equipment. Let's talk a little bit about the warrior's energy in closing. Prayer is the energy that enables the Christian. And it talks extensively here about prayer. It shows that prayer is not just of one kind. There are various ways of various aspects of prayer. <clears throat> There's supplication. That's entreaty. It's Jacob who said, I will not go. I won't let you go until you bless me. It's Moses saying, we're not going to go if you will not go with us. It's zealous, pleading. 
the Syrophoenician woman who he told we don't feed dogs. And she said, yes, but the dogs eat the crumbs. And Jesus blessed him. It's George Mueller praying for 50 years for five non-Christian friends of his. His diary records that the, right before he died, three of those were converted. Two of them, somebody observed, were converted shortly after he died. But he prayed for 50 years for those five men. That's supplication. Intercession. That's prayer on behalf of another person. I have a lost brother. I don't think his prayers probably go above the ceiling. And so I pray for him. I pray on God's behalf something he cannot pray for himself. That's intercession. Paul said to the Philippians, you all are partakers of my grace. You're able to share in my ex spiritual experience and draw from me. It says we're to pray in the spirit. This is not what I want, but it's what God wants. And we pray in his will. It's not man's will getting done in heaven. It's getting God's will done on earth. And the Bible says the spirit intercedes for us and pleads for us and interprets our prayers to God so that they come to God according to his will, even though I didn't know how to pray and just simply prayed the most uh, ignorant prayer I could pray, and the Holy Spirit perfected it, and God got it the way I should have prayed it. That's wonderful. It says, watching thereunto, keep on the alert, as Nehemiah, remember, was always on the alert with his people building that wall. Don't be caught unprepared like the disciples who they brought the demon-possessed boy, and Jesus said, this comes out by prayer and fasting. Well, you don't do the prayer and fasting, then you had to have it done uh, before uh, the need comes. Watch and pray. Four times in Scripture it says that. Perseverance in prayer. It's very clear in Scripture that God specially marks the prayer where somebody has persevered. And you say, why? Why doesn't God just meet the need immediately? Well, I think it's a little bit like a little boy comes to the table. If one of my sons came to the table and said, Daddy, I want a bicycle. Knowing little boys, I would have let that go in one ear and out the other. But he comes the next night and says, Daddy, I want a bicycle. Oh, okay, now I'll listen a little more carefully. Uh, the next night he says, Daddy, I need a bicycle. Oh, okay, now he realizes he needs a bicycle. And if he comes at every evening, he's just pleading for this bicycle and getting more and more explicit about his need and, and, and all. I'll finally say, you know what? I think that boy now will appreciate if I give, get him a bicycle. And I think uh, that perseverance has more to do with God getting us uh, to understand how desperately we need what we're requesting. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And Peter says, we're to pray without ceasing. Okay? And for all saints, we pray our Father. It's a corporate prayer. There's not I or me or mine in that whole prayer. It's a corporate prayer. We're praying as, as a body, okay? We win together. Christ wanted his disciples to pray for him. He knew he needed their prayers along with his, but you know they didn't do it. And they went out to be defeated because they weren't prepared. Jesus prayed and he, the, the battle was won there in the garden. And then he just went out to take the spoil and met that horrible experience with poise and dignity and fully collected uh, in a beautiful way. And then it says we should pray with thanksgiving. This is not mentioned here. It's mentioned in Philippians 4. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. William Law wrote that book, A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. How many have read that book? Uh, you pastors, actually, I would suggest you buy that book and give one to every uh, person in your congregation. That was the book that the Wesleys were reading. That was the book that Whitfield was reading. That's the book everybody was reading. William Law was the person behind all of that revival with that book, a, a serious call to devout and holy life. And in that book, this is a little bit off the subject, the thing that struck me the most in that book when I read it was his chapter on spiritual intent. He said, you are just as spiritual as you want to be. If you meet a spiritual person, mark it down. He intended to be spiritual. If you meet a person who's not spirit spiritually minded, you can mark it down. He had no great intent to be spiritual. Well, he emphasizes this with, about thankfulness. Would you know who is the greatest saint in the world? It is not he who prays most or fasts most. It is not he who gives the most alms 
or is more eminent for temperance, chastity, or justice, the greatest saint in the world is he who is always thankful to God, who wills everything as God wills, who receives everything as an instance of God's goodness, and has a heart always ready to praise God for it. In everything give thanks. Matthew Henry, the great Bible trans, uh, interpreter, was once accosted by thieves and robbed of his purse. He wrote these words in his diary. Let me be thankful first that I was not robbed before. Second, that although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, because they took everything, it wasn't much. And fourth, <laughs> Because it was I who they robbed and not something else. Here was a man that had all those things to thank God about after he was robbed. There's a legend that a man found a barn where the devil kept his seeds ready to be sown. And was told that those seeds would grow anywhere. When he questioned the devil, the devil sheepishly admitted that those seeds could grow everywhere but one place. Those seeds of discouragement except in a thankful heart, they would not grow there. Thank God, the roar of the world in my ears. Thank God for the roar of the world. Thank God for the mighty tide of fears against me always hurled. Thank God for the bitter, the ceaseless strife. Thank God for the stress and the pain of life. Oh, thank God, thank God, thank God for God. Shall we take out our hymnals and turn to the song, um, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. That's 497. George Duffield was a powerful preacher against slavery. And after he had preached vigorously against slavery, the elders in his church did not agree with his message and he was dismissed as the pastor. He rented a building down the street and began to preach against slavery and other things, injustice. And one Saturday there were a thousand men there and all of them committed themselves to Christ. And he said in that meeting that he would stand faithful to the trust that God gave to him even though his, his right arm was torn from his shoulder. During the next week, he went to visit someone who was operating some piece of equipment with a, horses with a sweep, and he reached out to pet one of the horses. He caught his clothing in the machinery, and he literally did have what he had sort of prophesied. His arm, right arm, was ripped off. And while he lay dying, somebody asked him what his words were, his last words were, and he said, stand up. Tell the men to stand up for Jesus. Well, we have that in the, the third verse. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, which, armor which we've been talking about. And watching unto prayer, where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. Let's sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Do so stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on And watching unto prayer, where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there.
everybody stand. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long this day. The noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him that overcometh a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. Let's sing that optional ending. Do so stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not, it must not suffer loss. Let's do it again. Stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner. It must not, it must not suffer loss. You may be seated. Let's realize that the Bible was serious when it says, be not deceived. The devil is determined to destroy every one of us and only be honest faithfulness and the whole armor of God that will protect us shall we pray father we thank you for this wonderful warning and specific directions as to what armor we need to use and how we need to use it and help us Lord to be faithful in applying that in every situation not allowing our mind to rationalize not allowing ourselves to take off the breastplate of righteousness not allowing ourselves to be deceived by lies rather than the truth. And Lord, helping, help us, Lord, to preach the gospel of peace. Help us not to take the gospel without that wonderful gospel of peace. Because we know that when that is done, there's always a disaster of war and Christians getting involved. So help us to take that part of the gospel wherever we go. Bless this congregation. Help them, Lord, to put up a successful fight not only individually, but as a congregation against every inroad of Satan and all of his minions and the world. Help them, Lord, to be on guard every moment of every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Speaking of the, uh, the enemy that we have, I have in my mind a picture of that one, I forget where he was, he was the man that was living in the caves and he was cutting himself with a knife and they tried to chain him but the chains couldn't hold him and he would break them and there he lived in the mountains screaming in terror and all that he did. Well, I tend to think that's the enemy's goal for each and every one of us. That's where he'd like to have each and every one of us. And we have here a, a, a beautiful set of armor that we've been given. It's believed that the Apostle Paul was bound in chains in prison, and he was looking at that Roman soldier with all his armor, the helmet, the breastplate, the sword, and everything that he had, and Paul was writing this letter and he says, aha, 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 aha. And he wrote this letter and we have this beautiful set of armor. It's not as the world thinks, it's truth. It's not as the world thinks about armor. The world would think F-16s or 35s or nuclear and all those things. But here, it's truth. It's righteousness, it's peace, it's faith, it's right biblical thinking, it's prayer, and it's the Word of God. These things will keep us safe, but we must abide therein. We must. So, amen for the Word of God.
for the truth of God and his word. He's given us what we need, and we need to walk in it. Amen. So we'll close the meeting. It's been good for us to be here. It's been rich. Thank you for laboring in the word. And we will be back here for 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And I think, was everybody here when I announced how it works? I think most of us were here. You're responsible for your own supper tomorrow, so bring it in the morning if you tend to stay for the day. Uh, bring your own picnic. We'll have barbecues here for um, available, but you're responsible for your food. And the evening session, we have it down for 7. We'll see if we need to go a bit earlier, but we'll plan that tomorrow. We have it starting at 7. I don't know how long the evening session is, but we'll, it will not be a short. Okay. <laughs> We'll work with the schedule tomorrow then. If we can, we can maybe bump it up a bit. We'll work with that one. So let's rise again for a word of prayer as we close. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gifts and the provision that you've given us as your children. Thank you that you've truly not left us as orphans. You've given us your Holy Spirit. And you've given us what we need to bring us safely home. And not only bring us safely home, but to be used by you in the time that we are here. Thank you for the burden that has been once again placed on our hearts. A good burden from you. A refreshing time to hear the word of God. To be refreshed in our thinking and to be encouraged in all that we have from you, Father. We pray again that you would help us to see these things clearly, walk in them, give us strength day by day. Father, we want to lift up each one to you, each one that's here. Meet the needs of each individual heart, Father. There may be some here who the enemy's really on, God, I pray that you would protect that one. Put your hand upon each individual life. Increase our faith. Help us to see truth. Help us to think rightly, Father. Help us to think as your word says we should think. Fill us with your peace. May the word of God be rich in our lives. Help us to know how to use it, Father. Thank you for that armor. Thank you for giving us the things that we need. We want to trust our lives to you. We want to commit ourselves to you. And we look to you for more rich blessings, Father. We need you. We confess that openly and honestly. We need you. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are dismissed. It's been good for us to be here. Thank you all for coming. May God richly bless you.